Wow. Um, I'm Bruce Chapman. I'm from the Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. This is a very, very special gig from the Crawford School. This is the Crawford Oration. It's the most important public event that we do. I'll be chairing tonight's event uh, as a representative of Professor Tom Compass, our director who apologises for not being here tonight. I start with welcome to country. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. We're very pleased you, you're here. And this crowd and this group and the enthusiasm for this event, event has been extraordinary. It was within a few hours that we reached 1,500 registrations with a capacity of 1,300. And I think it says something strong and profound about the hunger and interest for intelligent and informed and clear public policy. <clears throat> Tonight we have our favourite ever guest, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. He's visiting Australia as part of the Economic Society Eminent Speakers Series and Crawford School is the major national sponsor. I'd like to acknowledge the ANU Public Policy Fellows and distinguished guests in attendance today and to note a message from Tom Compass, which is the following. At Crawford School, we strive to lead and shape today's public policy debates through research, professional education and policy engagement. Today's lecture is an excellent example of the types of events that we conduct to spur public debate and initiate important discussions relevant to Australia as well as the global community. Just a couple of points very quickly about Crawford and our mission and our institutions. We have a quarterly magazine known as Advance and a flagship journal, Asia and the Pacific Policy Studies. The journal is supported by the Asia and Pacific Policy Society and works to position research on the region within the mainstream of public policy. I've been instructed to say that if you're not already a member of the society, you are highly encouraged to sign up. Membership is free, apart from the time it takes, and available to anyone who'd like to be part of the growing public community and public policy community in our region. Again, thank you so much for coming. I think this event will be very, very special. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Joseph Stiglitz, multiple Nobel Laureate, to speak tonight on the global financial crisis. Professor Stiglitz is widely recognised as one of the world's leading economists. He's a university professor at Columbia University, New York, having previously taught at All Souls Oxford, Yale, MIT, Stanford and Princeton. Professor Stiglitz was the recipient of the 2001 Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information. And he was a lead author of the 1995 report on the of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the Nobel Peace Prize. I asked him before whether he's worked out his fraction of the Peace Prize, and he said there is no algorithm as yet. <laughs> Professor Stiglitz has also held many noteworthy positions, including Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisers during the Clinton administration and Senior Vice President of the World Bank. In 2009, Professor Stiglitz was appointed by the President of the United Nations General Assembly to chair the Commission of Experts on Reform of the International Financial and Monetary System. In 2011, uh, Times named Professor Stiglitz as one of the most 100 influential people in the world. He is now serving as president of the International Economic Association. Tonight, we are greatly honoured to have him with us to share his thoughts on the global financial crisis, to review the circumstances around the collapse of the global economy in 2008, and to look at whether the crisis has really been averted. Professor Stiglitz will speak for about 30 minutes or a bit more, and then we'll take questions, moderated by Professor Bruce Chapman for the final time. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Joseph Stiglitz. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's a real pleasure to be here again. Uh, the last visit to Australia, I learned that uh, you're not supposed to call it the global financial crisis, but the North Atlantic financial crisis. <laughs> Uh, and the reason, of course, is that uh, your government responded to the events of 2008 with very strong measures which enabled Australia to avoid uh, participating in uh, the global financial crisis. So it didn't hit uh, Australia, didn't, uh, and, and China and a number of other countries also avoided uh, the global financial crisis. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, some of the lessons that we've learned from the global financial crisis, try to explain why it is that six years after the crisis, seven years after the bubble broke uh, that led to the crisis, the United States and Europe are really not back to health. I'll describe a little bit uh, the state of our economies and try to extract from that some lessons, not only for economic policy, but for the way we think about the economy. As most of you know, the crisis that began in 2008 is the worst crisis that we've had in more than three quarters of a century. And the economics profession as a whole, uh, and the economic models which central banks and governments used didn't predict the crisis. It's far worse than that. Uh, they, the model said it couldn't happen. Uh, the models that were used commonly by, by economists, as I say, by central banks, uh, argued that markets were efficient and were stable. And obviously, efficient markets don't have bubbles. But obviously those models were wrong. And one of the things that should have come out of the crisis is a rethinking of those models and an attempt to understand why they were wrong and how we can make them better. Just to give you one example, uh, a central focus of most central banks was on inflation. Some central banks, like the European Central Bank, had a mandate to focus only on inflation. And the idea was, was very simple. The view was that keeping inflation low and stable was necessary and almost sufficient for assuring economic prosperity. Because the view was that if the government did that, then markets would take care of everything else. Well, with that in mind, Central bankers, uh, United States and Europe, allowed a bubble to develop. They paid, focusing just on inflation, they said, uh, don't worry about uh, these bubbles. They argued that you couldn't tell a bubble uh, uh, un until after it broke, and that the cost of fixing the bubble was less than the cost of interfering with the wonders of the marketplace. We now understand that that was wrong, that a single-minded focus on inflation was not sufficient to protect the economy. The losses from inflation were minuscule compared to the losses that we've incurred as a result of the crisis. And central banks in most parts of the world have shifted. In the United States, we focus on now on employment, growth, inflation, and financial stability. The underlying microeconomics was well understood well before uh, the, uh, the crisis. Uh, the idea, the, the fundamental idea uh, that, that the advocates of, of this view, the view that markets are necessarily efficient and stable, uh, go back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith's idea of an invisible hand. The invisible hand, uh, the idea was that uh, individuals in the pursuit of profits uh, in their own self-interest would be led as if by an invisible hand to outcomes 
that would maximize the well-being of society as a whole. Well, now we understand, and research that I had done uh, had shown, that the reason that the invisible hand often seemed invisible was that it wasn't there. <laughs> that whenever there were imperfections of information, asymmetries of information, incomplete risk markets, that is always, uh, there are market failures which systematically lead to economic inefficiencies. And there are still governments that still don't understand this and that still believe that markets on their own are efficient, in spite of the fact that there are historically over 200 years of examples of market failures, and some of them, like this recent crisis, on a dramatic scale. I don't think anybody should or would claim that the pursuit of self-interest, which is also called greed, on the part of bankers led to the well-being of our society. Uh, it led to a global calamity. The central bankers who were well informed about economics perhaps were as vulnerable to these fallacies as those who were not. Ben Bernanke, after the crisis, went so far as to say there was nothing wrong with the models that were used, just their implementation. But I think he was fundamentally wrong. In fact, he was so wrong that, uh, so misled by the models that even after the bubble broke, he was asked, will it have effects on the economy? And he said, no, we've diversified risk. We spread risk in such a way that our economy is protected and we're stable. Now, even the logic of that should have been obviously wrong, clear that it was wrong. And just think about it. Uh, if you have a disease, uh, if, if somebody, say, arrived in New York, 50 people arrived in New, in New York with the disease, and uh, you asked, what are you going to do about these people, all of whom, say, are carrying uh, s smallpox? The economist's recommendation, the economists who believe in this idea of diversification, would say, let's spread the risk. Let's send two of the people to each of the states around the country. <laughs> and that would diversify the risk. Well, it's obvious that example shows that underlying their mind, uh, they have the wrong model. There are some instances where diversification works, but there are some instances where that kind of diversification actually is a disaster. And in this particular case, spreading America's toxic mortgages around the world made what was, would have been an American disaster into a global disaster. When I go to Europe, I always thank the Europeans for actually have engaged in deregulation because they bought some 40% of our toxic mortgages. If they hadn't done it, the American downturn would have been much worse. So yes, diversification helped us, but it obviously uh, contributed to the Euro crisis, which has been uh, very hard. The flaws in the reasoning of our central bankers, our economic officials, uh, had many dimensions. Uh, one of them was a kind of incoherence. After the crisis, people at the IMF always talked about the risk of contagion. Contagion is like a contagious disease. But before the crisis, they always talked about the benefits of diversification. And they never put those two sides of the argument together. And of course, if, what they should have realized is that, that if there's greater interdependence ex ante, there's greater risk of contagion ex post. Now, there are ways of dealing with it. In the case of electricity networks, when you make, bring electricity networks together, you economize in, in electrical generating capacity, but you have the risk of a outage in one part of the system shutting down the whole system. 
In the United States, we actually went through that experiment and a, a outage in a, a small substation in Ohio brought down the whole east coast of the United States. Interesting experiment because the population went up nine months later. But, <laughs> but in terms of uh, electricity management, it wasn't very good. Well, we know now what to deal with this. We have circuit breakers. The analogous thing in economics are capital controls, or we call capital account management techniques. But the IMF and the US Treasury oppose these very strongly. Finally, finally, they now understand after the crisis that those are good things. And the IMF, which in 1997 had tried to change its charter to force countries to liberalize their capital markets and not to have these kinds of controls, now says that they're a good thing. It's an interesting example of where thinking has changed in a dramatic way as a result of the crisis. Another example of the kind of intellectual incoherence uh, has to do with, with the discussion that Greenspan did uh, after the crisis. He was asked to testify about what had happened, and he said uh, he was surprised. Uh, there was a flaw in his reasoning. He thought banks would be able to manage their risk, would have the incentive to manage their risk better. But I was surprised that he was surprised. <laughs> because if you looked at the incentive structures that banks, bank managers had, bank managers had incentives to act in a short-sighted way with excess, uh, excessive risk-taking. And if they hadn't behaved badly, we would have had to rewrite our microeconomics textbooks. Well, the good news is that we don't. The one thing economists agree, incentives matter, and they had incentives to behave badly, and guess what? They behave badly. <laughs> but the consequence, of course, is that the economy, the global economy, has suffered enormously. So when it comes to the question, who's to blame to the, for the crisis? Obviously, I think the banks have the most to blame. Uh, they engaged in excessive risk taking. They engaged in predatory, discriminatory lending. Uh, they engaged in a host of really bad practices, market manipulation. I'll come back to talk about that a little bit later. The regulators should have stopped them from doing it. We should understand that there's a history of 200 years of banks behaving this way, and why you would think that they suddenly stopped behaving badly uh, was a mystery. The reason, of course, is actually not that hard to understand. After the, the Great Depression, we passed, and most other countries passed, good regulations to stop the bad behavior of banks. And it worked. And we have 35 years of economic stability, not, uh, not a serious bank crisis around the world. And then somehow the idea, because we hadn't had any crises for 35 years, the idea spread that we didn't need regulation, when the reason we didn't have a crisis was because we had regulation. The idea we didn't need regulation spread. And guess what? Since 1980, since the Reagan-Thatcher era, We've had more than 100 financial crises. So deregulation worked in the way predicted. It worked to create more volatility. And it was only America's financial crisis that was bigger and better than others. When I'm in Australia, I always hear people say, we're, we're the biggest of the best. But this is a case, and I'll cover you a couple of others, where America really did a better job. <laughs> so, I blame first the banks, I blame, blame the regulators. Uh, secondly, because the regulators should have understood this and should have stopped the banks from behaving badly. But I also blame economists, or more particularly, other economists. <laughs> because they promulgated ideas that both the banks and the regulators used that led them to to deregulation, to the kinds of regulatory frameworks, to the kinds of policies 
that led to the, the problems that we had. Well, it's not a surprise, given that the models didn't really have a good conception of what was going on with the economy, couldn't predict the crisis, couldn't even predict the crisis, as I said, after the bubble broke, that they weren't very good in responding to the crisis. And the result is that the crisis has been long lasting. It was hoped that if we acted forcefully in 2008 and 2009, that it would be like other crises, short-lived, a little bit longer than the typical economic fluctuation, but short-lived. But we've had now a half decade, more than a half decade, of weak economy. In the United States, the recession officially began in 2007. And we're now in 2014, and nobody would say we're back to health. I'll describe the numbers uh, very briefly. Europe is even in worse shape. In fact, the only thing that makes America feel good is that things could be worse, and we look at the other side of the Atlantic, we see that they are worse. The fact is, as I say, at the beginning of the crisis, we, we said we wouldn't make the kind of mistakes that Japan made that led to the Japanese malaise, two decades of slow economic growth, but then we proceeded to make mistakes that were even worse than Japan's. And as I said, we've already had more than a half decade of poor economic performance, and no one really thinks that we'll be back to normal for a very long time. One way to think about where we are today is to project back to the Great Depression. The Great Depression began, you might say officially, with the stock market crash in 1929. In 1936, some people thought we were getting out of the Great Recession, of the Great Depression. And the result of that was that, that belief that we were getting out was the argument that we ought to cut back on the New Deal, mild doses of austerity to get our budget in better shape. And guess what happened? We went into a double dip. And we didn't get out of the Great Depression until World War II. It was government spending that got us out of the Great Depression. It would have been great if we had used the government spending for investments in people, infrastructure, technology, but we didn't have that choice. We had to spend the money on armaments to protect our country. But it was government spending, and we shouldn't forget that, it was government spending that got us out of the Great Depression. Well, right now we've gone seven years into an economic malaise, recession in Europe, in some parts of Europe it's a depression, and the only question is, how long will it last? And if we follow the wrong policies, which some governments are advocating, some, uh, some, some uh, parties are advocating, it could last a very long time. So let me describe briefly where we are and talk just a little, even more briefly about where Europe is. If we look at where the growth trend had been, growth trend beginning, say, 1980, the period after 1980, let me emphasize, was not a period of really strong economic growth. It was markedly slower than the decades after World War II. And that itself is an important lesson. We began deregulating, liberalizing, all the privatizing, and that was the period where our growth slowed down. And it was also the period, the period after World War II was a period of shared prosperity where every group in our country grew, saw their incomes increase, but the people at the bottom saw their in incomes increase the most. And since 1980, only the top has seen their incomes grow. But even looking at that very slow growth after 1980 with, under the ideas of deregulation, liberalization, and so forth, we are 15, more than 15% below where we would have been had we not had the crisis. And the gap is still increasing. So the total loss for the United States 
is in excess of $5 trillion. So anybody that talks to me about government waste, I say no government has ever wasted resources on the scale of which America's financial, private financial markets have wasted resources. We still have almost not 20 million Americans who would like a full-time job and can't get it. Now, when I say 20 million, I always feel, when I t talk about 20 million in China, it seems like uh, hardly anybody. But when I talk about 20 million in Australia, it sounds like a lot of people. <laughs> so, so I think Australians can really understand when I say 20 million, it's like the whole country is wandering around without a job. Labor, the only reason the unemployment rate is as low as it is that labor force participation is lower than it's been in more than three decades. It's as low as it's been since women started entering the labor force. The way we count unemployment is to ask people whether they're actively looking for a job. But so many people have looked and looked for years and years and haven't found a job that they've given up looking. But of course they're not employed. It's just that they've given up looking for a job. If we look at the growth that has occurred in the last uh, seven years after the crisis, 2007, 2008, since then, per person within the working age population, if you look across the advanced countries of the North Atlantic, uh, Europe and America, what you see is only the US and Germany have had any economic growth, and that economic growth has been truly paltry. In any other circumstance, it would be considered to be a disaster. In the case of Germany, which is looked at as the most successful country in Europe, it's under 1%. But making things even worse is, if you look at how it's distributed, in Germany, the bottom 30% have seen their income decline. In the United States, Officially, the economic downturn was over in 2009. But since 2009, 95% of all the increase in the income has gone to the top 1%, which means the bottom 99% haven't heard about recovery. And that increase in inequality was on top of an already high level of inequality. The result is that today, median income in the United States is lower than it was 25 years ago. So for people in the middle, there has been no increase in income for a quarter century. And things are worse in some, many of the demographic, social demographic groups in our country. So one social democratic group that I identify with is American males. American males have an income that is lower, median income that is lower than it was 40 years ago. So if you want to understand why American politics sometimes looks strange, why there are a lot of angry people, it's totally understandable. Our economy has not been delivering, our market economy has not been delivering in the way it should. That is an important lesson because the countries that have tried to imitate American economic policies have succeeded in getting results similar to America. <laughs> and as you debate economic policies here, you should think about that. In Europe, as I say, things are worse. In countries like Spain and, and Greece, uh, in fact, in most of the countries, per capita income adjusted for inflation is lower than it was at the big onset of the crisis. There's been zero economic growth on average, let alone median. The unemployment rate, in, on average, in Europe is over 12%. But in some countries, like Spain, it's twice that. 
And if you look at youth unemployment, youth unemployment in Spain is over 50%, and in Greece over 60%, and GDP is down 25% from what it was in 2008. These countries are in depression. When I was at the World Bank, and we described the East Asia crisis, I was told by the US Treasury officials, I won't name who, not to use the word depression because they said it was depressing. <laughs> but that was the only way you could describe what was going on, and that's the only way you could describe what is going now on in Spain and Greece. Can you imagine graduating from college, worked hard, doing everything right, and told your prospects for a job are less than 50% year after year. And it means that many of them, to give you a really bleak prospect, have to live with their parents <laughs> for years and years until their 30s. Well, um, so the question I want to uh, turn to now is why has the US and many other countries in Europe not recovered? And the basic answer is fairly simple. It's a lack of aggregate demand. And there are several reasons for this lack of aggregate demand. One I've already mentioned, austerity, government cutbacks. Even the United States, which has not talked about austerity very much, has had a mild form of austerity. We have 500,000, roughly 500,000, fewer public sector employees than we did in 2008 before the crisis. If we had normal growth with the growth of our population, we'd have some two million more employees. So we've had cutbacks de facto of two and a half million. No wonder with those magnitude of cutbacks, the economy's not performing, particularly because we haven't fixed the financial system. And so we not only have cutbacks on the public side, we have weaknesses in the private side. But there's a second reason I want to emphasize, and I've already hinted at, and that's the fact that we have this growing and high level of inequality. Now, how does high inequality affect uh, economic performance? It actually affects it in, uh, in a large number of ways. It affects long-term economic growth. It affects stability. One of the ways, though, is a very simple one, that those at the top don't spend as much money as those at the bottom. Those at the bottom have no choice, and they tend to spend 100% of their income. Those at the top are able to save 10, 15, 20% of their income. And so when you have redistribution from the bottom to the top, which has been going on in the United States, inequality reached a, a, a level not seen since the, since the 1928, uh, right before the Great Recession, uh, you're going to have weak aggregate demand. Unless the government and monetary authorities do something about it, and Bernanke and Greenspan did something about it, they created a bubble. It was a short-term palliative, but it was clearly not sustainable. Because of that bubble, those at the bottom 80% of America were consuming 110% of their income. And that enabled the economy to keep going. But as I said, it was not sustainable. And as one of my predecessors as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors once said, that which is not sustainable won't be sustained. <laughs> so uh, this inequality is actually one of the reasons that our economy, this growing inequality is one of the reasons our economy is not doing very well. And it's interesting, at one point this might have been viewed as a radical position, but today even the IMF, which is not known to be a radical organization, has said that inequality is bad for economic growth and economic stability. There's a third reason that uh, there's a lack of aggregate demand, or fundamental problem in our economy, which is the need for structural transformation 
Every economy is constantly needing a structural transformation, but the challenges right now are particularly great. And in some ways are similar to those that face the, the economy, the global economy, 80 years ago before the Great Depression. Then the structural transformation was a movement from agriculture to manufacturing. We were the victims of our own success. In the 19th century, some 70% of the population had to be engaged in agriculture and related activities in order to produce the food that we needed to survive. Now, say, in the United States, 2 to 3% of the workforce produces more food than even an obese population can consume. So that's a great success, but it poses a problem. All those people that were working in agriculture have to move somewhere else. And the problem is the markets don't do that kind of structural transformation on their own very well. And for obvious reasons that are understandable, that when incomes in the agricultural sector go down, in the United States they went down in the period, say, 28 to 32 by more than 50%. When incomes go down, people don't have the resources to move to the urban sector to make the investments in, in moving and in learning the skills that would make their productivity higher in manufacturing to facilitate this kind of tr structural transformation. And so they were trapped in the rural sector, and our economy was trapped in a recession, depression. And it was, as I say, government spending that got us out, but it was, the government spending was actually an industrial policy. It helped our economy move from agriculture to industry. The government, after World War II, gave everybody in our population, free edu everybody who, who had fought in the war, which was essentially everybody, free education, free, or, free higher education. And it was on that basis that we managed to become the industrial power that we, we were. We're now engaged in another kind of structural transformation, but it's even a more difficult one. We're going from manufacturing to a service sector economy. It's more difficult because now there are all these global competitors. Global employment in manufacturing is going down. But because of changing comparative advantage, our share in that declining global employment is going to go down. And that means we have to move into other sectors. And among the sectors, as I say, is going to be the service sector. It's going to be the key sector. But within the service sector, the key areas are going to be education and health. But education and health are two sectors which are, for good reason, largely associated with government finance. But this is just the time where we're cutting back in government finance. So government policy, rather than facilitating the structural transformation, are actually impeding it. So in a way, the recession has exacerbated all the problems. It led to greater austerity, led to greater inequality, and impeded the ability of the government to facilitate the structural transformation. The result of this is that the pro we are experiencing a prolonged economic downturn. Let me put it in one other way that may help uh, crystallize the nature of our problem. A lot of people back in 2008, Obama administration thought, well, we've had a bump, our banks are a little sick, all we need to do is give them a few trillion dollars, make them feel better, don't upset the bankers. That would be, you know, uh, that, that would be very bad for our economy because bankers aren't happy, the economy's not going to be happy. So we just say, throw money at them, don't, don't, don't scold them too much, uh, and uh, put the banks in the hospital for 18 months, and then uh, the banks will be healthy and we can pick up where we left off in 2007. 
So the idea was we needed a short-term stimulus while the banks were temporarily weak, and then once uh, they get back to health, the economy will pick up. Well, that was obviously a wrong theory. We gave the banks a lot, a lot of money. The banks are healthier, not perfect. The government's still underwriting over 90% of all mortgages. SME lending, lending to small and medium-sized enterprises, still about 20% below the crisis. So it's not like we're really back to health. But their profits are pretty good. They're giving, paying big dividends, even bigger bonuses. But our economy is not back to health. That should be pretty clear. And the reason it's not back to health was in 2007, our economy was not well. There were all these problems I've just described. The problem of inequality, the problem of structural transformation, and there were some global problems I haven't had time to talk about. So we papered over the problems by a bubble. But now that we've taken away the bubble, and hopefully we won't go back to create another bubble, if we went back to 2007 without the bubble, we would be a weak economy, which is exactly where we are. Except our banking system, our financial system, is still not perfectly where it was, and inequality has gotten worse, and the, abilities to de- the ability of the government to deal with the structural transformation has gotten worse, and austerity has exacerbated the problem. So let me conclude. As I said, the market economy, as it's been functioning in the United States and Western Europe and many other countries, is not working the way it's supposed to. It's not delivering for most citizens. There is a debate going on. Is it the laws of economics? Is it inevitable that the market economy should fail in the dramatic way that it has failed? And it's not just a, as I pointed out, it's not just a couple of years that it's not been working well. Median income for an American is lower than it was 25 years ago. That's a quarter century of stagnation. Well, my view is it's not inevitable. These failures, the growth in inequality, is not a in result of inexorable economic forces. It's a result of politics and policies. There are some countries that have managed to have lower levels of inequality. The Scandinavian countries, they have the same laws of economics that apply up in those northern climes as apply in the United States and the UK. But they've made different political choices, and those choices have led to markedly different outcomes. The Gini coefficient, a standard measure of of inequality, in Denmark is half of that of Australia, and is even a smaller percentage of that of the United States. And this represents a fundamental change in the way we think about inequality. We used to say, yes, inequality is bad, but if we were to get rid of inequality, it would reduce our growth impair our economic performance. Now we realize that inequality, to the extent that it's grown, the extremes that it's grown, the manner in which it's grown, actually is imposing a cost. We are paying a high price for this inequality. And as I say, this is a view that is now becoming not just, uh, becoming a mainstream view, a view that the IMF has been advocating. So, The lesson of this is that we ought to be working for shared prosperity, the kind of shared prosperity that the United States had in the decades after World War II. And just let me conclude, because I know there are a lot of debates going on in Australia about these economic policies, and reiterate what I said before. The countries that have followed the American model have wound up with lower economic growth, 
and more inequality and lower economic performance as it should be measured about by what happens to the typical citizen, not what happens to Bill Gates or those at the very top, but what happens to most citizens. And I hope that as one looks back on these experiences of the global financial crisis and what we've learned in the last seven years, that uh, we take to heart the lessons that it's taught us uh, and try to create uh, an economic framework that will lead to more stable and more prosperous and more shared uh, economic prosperity. Thank you. We have, <clears throat> we have about 15 minutes for for questions and answers. There will be microphones, there are microphones at the front on either side and at the back. So if you could go there if you have a question. There are two principals. Please um, let us know your name and please keep it short. So I'm having trouble kind of seeing out there, but um, do we have a question or a comment? Can you go to the microphone please? That's a, the that's a problem. Hi, um, up here. No, we can't see. Okay, we're having up trouble seeing. Sorry. Up, up here. Oh. Hello. Okay, please go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, um, my name's Yen. I'll keep it short. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, about university deregulation. Um, Christopher Pine, our education minister, has recently said that we have a lot to learn from the American models. Of, uh, of higher education funding and deregulation of that. Ian Young, our vice chancellor, is kind of like the poster boy for deregulation of universities in Australia. I'd like to know what you think about deregulation and whether or not our sector, higher education sector, can actually benefit from it. Why don't you go ahead on that one? Okay. Uh... <laughs> Well, first let me emphasize that most and almost, in fact, almost all of the successful universities in the United States are either state-run universities or not-for-profit universities. The private universities, private for-profit, do excel in one thing, exploiting poor people. <laughs> and, it has been a constant struggle uh, because we've known that they've been engaged in that kind of, of uh, exploitation for more than two decades. When I was in the Clinton administration, we tried to regulate these for-profit exploitive universities. And you can see it in terms of the, you know, it wasn't very complex regulation. We said in order to get government funding for uh, student loans, Pell Grants, uh, you had to show that you graduated students, not a very high demand, that at least maybe 10% of your students graduated, uh, and that somebody got a job. <laughs> uh, the answer was they thought that was obtrusive uh, uh, regulation. We had a minor regulation that said that 90% of the revenue, uh, uh, no more than 90% of the government uh, of the revenue could come from government. So what did they do? They were very good at circumvention. What they did is they raised the tuition a little bit, got government money, and then used some of the money to give a rebates to the students, which they called scholarship. So there was no real source of money other than the government, and they were just pretending to make, uh, give money back of money that they had overcharged uh, on their education. So there, there is almost universal agreement in the United States, except among the lobbyists for these institutions, uh, 
that these have been a disaster. And they've been particularly predatory on, as I say, uh, people from poor families, people who, you know, the one that really gets most Americans, uh, they've, they've been really predatory against uh, people leaving the military, uh, people who fought for the country, thought they were serving the country, and then they come in and try to take advantage of these people who, who are uh, not well informed about the terrible success records of these uh, schools. So my view has been well, just the opposite. We, we ought to be regulating more, not less, and the only thing that is stopping this regulation is the lobbyists for these institutions. And it is really, in the case of the United States, a national shame uh, what, has, what has been happening with these for-profit universities. In the case of, let me just say one, uh, one other aspect, uh, which is a little bit rela related, and that is the financing of education. Uh, I talked a lot about how median income is stagnated and actually lower today than it was 25 years ago. But one of the really uh, sad eff effects of uh, the crisis was that um, uh, we had cutbacks in government support, of, part of austerity was cutbacks in government support of education. And universities had no choice but to raise tuition. So poor Americans were caught in this bind between incomes going down and tuition going up. The only way they could go to school to get a higher education was to borrow. Average American graduating from college, I know these numbers seem small to you, but has a debt of $25,000, $30,000. That's the average. But many of them have student debts of over 100,000. The banking, the financial industry, succeeded in passing a law that said if you borrow money to finance education, you could never discharge that even in bankruptcy, no matter what happens to you. And if your parent co-signs the loan, they can't discharge the debt. Even if, you, if their kid dies, in an accident or from a disease, the parent has to repay the debt. And when I went around the United States talking about my book, The Price of Inequality, the most poignant stories were about were, were from parents who had gone through this kind of, of experience. So the result of all of this is that American student debt now is over $1.1 trillion, more than our student than all the credit card debt in the country. It's weighing down our economy. Poor Americans face this dilemma. Do they take on this huge amount of debt or not get a college education? But they know that if they don't get a college education, their lifetime prospects are bleak. The median income of a young American who doesn't have a college, who've just gone to high school, uh, has been actually plummeting. It's about, I can't remember the exact numbers, about 20, 30 percent below what it was a decade, two decades ago. And the result of this is, for Americans, America's, a, a young American's lifetime prospects are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. And that's because of the way we finance education. And I gather there's some discussion of whether you should follow the American model. And I find this strange. I think, I think we'll, we'll take uh, a few at a time. So let's start with a two from there and two from there. And then we'll get Joe to respond. Uh, collective or to the collection. Thank you. Oh. Over, over here. Um, in the current political system, 
most of the solutions you recommend, the way I understand them, are of political suicide. For example, the very government in Australia who was applauded by you and others for avoiding the crisis was toppled, and we are now in going backward on those recommendations. So what's your solution for that, other than maybe letting the evolution lead to a revolution? <laughs> Is there another one from over there? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Sickles, you mentioned the um, uh, inability during the financial crisis for uh, regulators and I assume policy advisors too, to, um, to understand what, what was actually going on within the markets. Uh, I wonder to what extent you uh, believe now that we've that those regulators and policy advisors have learnt those lessons, and I'm thinking particularly about uh, the advent of things like dark pools and uh, high speed trading, some of those um, more opaque things which are going on at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the the answer obviously is different policymakers have been better at learning the lessons. Some of that is related to how close they are to Wall Street. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the major problems, I think, uh, that, that is associated with the crisis was the problem of too big to fail banks. When the banks are too big to fail, they know that undertaking risk is a one-way bet. If they win, they get the profits. If they lose, the public picks up the losses. Some some policymakers, like Mervyn King in the UK, the head of the central bank there, has uh, argued very, very strongly that if you're too big to fail, you're too big to exist, and said that they ought to be broken down and, and proposed various ways of, of ring fencing. Uh, in the United States, the policymakers most owned by Wall Street I don't know if that was the right word. <laughs> uh, Bernanke and Geithner uh, were not interested in too big to fail. They said, oh, that's not a problem. Uh, they said, well, well, we'll develop good, quote, resolution processes, as if that would solve the problem. Interestingly, some of the, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, regional central, we have a regional, the Federal Reserve has regional banks, and some of the regional banks, the one from Texas, the one from um, Kansas City, said, we think banks ought to be banks, not gambling casinos, and that they ought to be engaged in the business of lending, and that smaller banks are going to be better at that kind of process of lending, to, especially to small and medium-sized enterprises, and they were very strongly associated with, with doing something about too big to fail. They were also, another example of this kind of, what to do about the non-transparent derivatives, the CDSs, those gambling instruments that led to the government having to bail out AIG. One company in the United States, AIG, got $150 billion. Which again, I don't know how much is the, whether that's a big money for Australia, but it's a big money uh, for the United States, and that you know that's more money that we gave to one company than we gave to poor people over a decade. You know, we believe in corporate welfare, but not in individual welfare. So, but again, Geithner and Bernanke said that's fine. Let's keep it secret. Let's let's. Uh, uh, let's allow banks to engage in those risky derivatives. And the people like Fisher and, and Honig, who are actually want banks to be banks, said, no, that's not the business of, that's not the business of banking. So uh, I, th I think that the, the, uh, the process of, of, of Re-regulating our banks is, is sort of uh, the glass. We've, we've done some things that have moved in the direction, in the right direction, but many things have been left undone. Now, on the question of, of the practical politics, uh, whether, uh, you know, there are many reasons that governments uh, fail. 
uh, fail to get reelected. And it's not always uh, just bad policies. Uh, there are personality issues. Um, and there, there, there's the structure of the political process. For instance, uh, Al Gore got many more votes than Bush did in the first election. But the Supreme Court selected uh, Bush to be president. Uh, it wasn't a part of our democratic process uh, in the usual sort of way. Uh, if we had had proportional representation or any direct vote, uh, Gore would have been the president with, with very marked differences in our uh, outcome. Or to give you another example, uh, we have a uh, House of Representatives in the United States, one of the houses, is controlled by Republicans, even though the Democrat got more than one million more votes than the Republicans. The result of gerrymandering. If you look at the shape of some of the districts, they're very imaginative, but they have no uh, argument for them other than uh, trying to distort the political process. So, in my mind, uh, one of the main, main problems that we face in the United States, which I can say no more uh, better than I do Australia, uh, in the United States is that we've, we have a distorted political system in which we've moved from a principle of one person, one vote to something much more akin to one dollar, one vote. And uh, if we're going to make our democracy work, we have to reclaim that, and that's going to require more active citizen involvement. And uh, when that's happened, things have gone well, and we've had people uh, succeed in arguing for very mu many of the uh, very issues that I, I talked about. And just to give you one example, we had a very active discussion, debate about uh, who should be the head of the Federal Reserve. Uh, one of the candidates, the one that Obama wanted, was uh, one of his main achievements was uh, designing the law that ensured that derivatives would not be regulated. Some of us were skeptical about whether that was an achievement <laughs> and whether that qualified him to be the head of the Federal Reserve. Now that was a really interesting case because Obama really wanted him, but several of the senators who were very pivotal said it would be inappropriate, to put it mildly. And uh, we, we, we now have, uh, and the outcome of that was that Obama didn't get who he wanted and uh, one of my students is now the head of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> is there a question from upstairs? No? Uh, yeah. Over here. We'll just take two more from over here and then one from there and then we'll have to finish. I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, you described quite eloquently how the prevailing sort of neoliberal economic orthodoxy has been profoundly discredited not only by the most recent crisis but by the last 40 years of economic performance and yet many of those ideas austerity deregulation capital market liberalization are still driving particularly the australian policy agenda um, to borrow a phrase what why do these zombie economic ideas keep coming back <laughs> It can't just be a matter of vested interests because they continue to survive in economics faculties and, and uh, lobby groups and then the influential political um, uh, leaders. Why do they keep coming back and, and how can we stop them? <laughs> well, that's a good question and I, I, I don't think there's any good answer. Uh, uh, I think part of the answer clearly is special interest. Uh, that. Uh, a lot of people made a lot of money out of bank deregulation. Uh, you know, a lot of money uh, was moved from the bottom to the top. And uh, it served uh, the interest of, of a lot of people. There was a big party and it went into the political process. Uh, it got, they reinvested in the political process a small fraction of their profits. I, you know, I, I jokingly say, but it's not a joke, really, that the banks made much more money out of their investments in Washington than they ever made out of their investments 
anywhere else. Uh, th those other investments were a disaster, but the Washington investments paid off handsomely. So I, do, I, don't, I don't think you should underestimate the role of special interest. I don't know if any of you uh, saw the movie Inside Job. Uh, if, if you haven't, you should see it because it shows also the role of the economics profession uh, in all of this. And what it suggests is that economists are sometimes influenced by incentives as well. <laughs> and that there is more money, in a way, to espousing ideas that people are willing to pay for. And the financial sector is willing to pay for people to say things that the financial sector likes to hear. And it's a very subtle process. I don't think any of my colleagues who starred in that movie would, um, <laughs> would say that they were influenced in the slightest by economic incentives. And so, you know, one of the things I always find so striking is that economists believe that everybody else is driven by incentives except for themselves. <laughs> and I think there's two elements of that. I think economic incentive, non-economic non incentives are also important. And it is true that they are also affected by non-economic incentives. Uh, but I do think economic incentives uh, do play a role. And finally, there is an element, uh, particularly on faculty, uh, and you have to, for those of you who are PhD students, probably uh, uh, will appreciate this more. If you spent five, six years of your life showing that markets are perfect, very hard to say, oh boy, that was a waste of six years, now that I understand that markets are not perfect. Uh, <laughs> even though the first lecture in economics is some costs should be ignored, let bygones be bygones. So what have you spent wasting six years of your life? <laughs> it's better to waste those than to waste the next six years of your life. <laughs> but it's very hard to persuade economists of this basic principle. We have time for two quick further questions. I'll take one from here and one from there, and then we'll have to wrap up. I'm sorry. Professor, Professor Stiglitz, um, do you agree with the uh, very recent statement by the Bank of International Settlements that current dominant macroeconomic policies will not only manage to uh, restore sustainable and equitable economic growth, but are actually building a debt and asset bubble um, trap that could uh, result in a second global financial crisis even worse than the first? Well. I, I do agree that we haven't really solved the problem of financial stability. That was the remark I made before, that the reforms have not been adequate. And more broadly, with that quote, I, uh, without, I haven't seen their, their, their whole analysis, but let me say there's something very peculiar about current monetary policies. Um, the major instrument for trying to get the economy going again is low interest rates to encourage people to borrow more. And if you remember, what part of the problem of the crisis was excess debt. And part of the observation after the crisis was that we have an over-leveraged economy. So what is the major thrust of current monetary policy? get people more in debt. It's a strange thing, and I think that's what the BIS is, is, is observing that, uh, and the way they're doing it is low interest rates trying to create some new bubbles. So the whole thing is, it has an aura of, of hard to understand whether this is, uh, hard to believe that this is the best way of getting, solving the problem. And I think part of the reason goes back to what I talked about in my talk, none of this has gone, try to analyze what are the underlying sources of the weaknesses in our economy that necess seemingly necessitate the use of these other mechanisms, a bubble or a more debt, to get the economy going again. Final uh, question from the front, thank you. Professor Stiglitz, 
recently in an interview with Bill Moyes, you spoke about how the US government is helping the person who committed an accident uh, at the same time leaving the victim to bleed on the street. When asked about this situation, uh, Geithner, in an interview with uh, John Stewart, uh, said that it was the right thing to do and if they had not done that, uh, so, uh, my question is, sir, uh, is it now unreasonable to even expect uh, those who unleash this crisis to be held responsible for their actions? Yeah. Uh, the, there are many aspects of, your que uh, of, of the question. I mean, in, in one, let, let me first talk about just the, the economics. Uh, there were two ways to uh, help revive the economy. Uh, we could have given more of the money that, uh, you know, if you go back to the 2008 crisis, what precipitated it, it was a housing crisis. That's where it began. And uh, millions of Americans lost their homes. Uh, it, 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 it had a total, uh, very serious social consequences. Median wealth in the United States, I don't know if I mentioned that in my talk, median wealth in the United States went down by 40%. And that was partly because uh, uh, most people in the, in the middle, their major asset was their home and their home went down in value and many of them lost their home. Uh, it, was, it, it was truly tragic. But rather than helping homeowners, we did almost nothing for them. And even the Obama administration, even Geithner now admits that was a mistake. We threw money at the banks. So it was another example of trickle-down economics, the belief that if you throw enough money at the top, everybody will benefit. It was clearly wrong, and it didn't work. And it was very peculiar that we were helping the victimizers and not helping the victims. Uh, so that was one aspect, and I think it was one of the reasons to go back to, to the politics. I think it was bad politics as well as bad economics. It was one of the reasons, it's one of the reasons that there is suspicion of government activity now. They say, well, on a lot of people's part, there, there's a view that government is giving, helping the wealthy and not helping the people who need it. So why should I help the government? So it's really undermined the, the I, I, it was a, it, it, to, my, to my mind, it was really bad politics as well as bad economics. But the other part of the problem is the banks that were too big to fail were also too big to jail. And so very few of those who were responsible for the crisis and for the bad behavior of the banks, the market manipulation, the abuse of credit card practices, the predatory lending. In the United States, the banks even engaged in discrimination. They figured out who were the people most likely to be able to be preyed upon and they discovered it was Hispanics and African Americans and so they targeted those groups. Forty years after we passed anti-discrimination laws, they went ahead, they, they were like in another planet, and they said, oh, well, our responsibility is to our shareholders to maximize profits. And so that's what they did, or they tried to do. And not one of those people have gone to jail. So you ask, we have a system in which we actually lack individual responsibility. A few of them have been tried and a system of corporate responsibility allows them to evade individual responsibility. And in the end, in the case of corporations, the shareholders pay, but the managers walk off of the profits as if they had done nothing. The worst miscarriage of justice, perhaps, was in the, I don't know if you, many of you know about our robo-signing uh, scandal. Uh, 
one of the problems, the banks were so sloppy in their record keeping that their records of who owed money were not very good. To throw people out of their homes, they had to sign that they had inspected the records and the records were in good shape and that this person owed money and had been delinquent by a certain amount of, and that therefore there were grounds to throw them out. But there were so many people that they wanted to throw out of their homes that they couldn't inspect the records and the records were so bad that they couldn't do it even if they had wanted to. So they hired people to sign thousands of affidavits knowing that they were lying. They were committing perjury before the court thousands and thousands of times. It was called robo-signing. And the basis of that, thousands of people were thrown out of their homes who didn't owe anything. Not a single of the bankers has been held accountable. The bankers say, oh, well, most of those who we threw out of the homes probably owed something. And it was sort of like a system of justice that we have in the United States that says most of the people that we give capital punishment probably did something wrong. <laughs> but of course, this is not the rule of law. You say, rule of law is supposed to protect those who need protection, not the bankers. But our system of rule of law protected the bankers and not those who needed protection. And so, one of the outgrowths of, of, of the crisis is, is real questions about our rule of law and whether, in fact, we have the kind of system, you know, every morning, every American kid in school says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and they say, justice for all. And now we, we write that, justice for those who could afford it. Thank you. Professor Stiglitz is pleased to sign books at the, when this is all wrapped up. I wanted to just say a couple of words in, uh, in closing. Those of us in the academic economics profession know too well the intellectual contribution of Joseph Stiglitz. He more or less invented a new area of economic theory involving asymmetric information and at any point in time like right now there'll be people in economic seminars all over the world or and or PhD students involved exactly in that work it has had a profound effect on our discipline and the way we think uh, about economics and the way we also think about the role of government but there's something more than this which I wanted to bring to your attention which if you've listened at all tonight, you'll get this anyway. And it's a question of ethics, I think, and, and morals. And for Joseph Stiglitz, it, it takes two very obvious forms. And the first involves the topics that he chooses to think about, to research on, and to write about. And they're, they're just the biggest issues of our time. The measurement and mismeasurement of human welfare, the prevalence of poverty and inequality and what can be done about this, the causes and solutions to international financial failure, economic solutions to climate change, and the profound adverse consequences of misdirected, ideologically based and ignorant macroeconomic management. People can always, always choose what they want to do research on and what they want to focus on and they're his topics. And Behind them, they're essentially about the welfare of the human condition and about, essentially, also about inequality and poverty. But there's another issue too. I've got to know Joseph Stiglitz well and his work very well over the last five years. And if you know about his career, you'll see some aspects of behaviour which can only be admired hugely for the moral and ethical stance 
that he takes and you can see it and hear it in what he said tonight. There is a willingness there which is close to unique to confront and to take on powerful vested interests, groups with the financial and political power to damage public critics severely. He's done this with respect to his critique of the International Monetary Foundation and his strident objections to their previous and currently a little bit austerity agenda. He did it in the World Bank, for example, by putting on the agenda the issue of corruption as a matter for economics and as part of the remit for the World Bank's role. And most profoundly over the last few years he's done it with his continual opposition uh, and offence taken at what has happened with respect to government reactions in the United States involving Wall Street, the US banks, and in part uh, the role in, of the US administration itself for bailing out the rich and the powerful after the financial crisis, which in his very compelling view they had largely been responsible for. And I think as a public intellectual, it's not just the intelligence and the rigour and the power of communication that is so clear, but when you know what he does and the reasons he do it, there's, there, there is, and I think for those who know him and his work well, there should be profound admiration for the moral stances and the ethical position he takes. I think tonight has been very, very special. Uh, I hope you take the memory with you for a very long time. And thank you so much, Jason.